It's really something What I've waited for, I'm created for Something I'm supposed to be who I chose to be Somehow One should never be When I was a child, the principal of my elementary school brought me a microscope. Because I wrote science fiction stories, he thought I was interested in science. But the truth was, I didn't want to grow up to be Stephen Hawking. I wanted to be Captain Kirk. We have to prepare for blast While there were stars in my eyes, there were also tunes in my head. Fast forward to 30 years later. In a small theater in the heart of Manhattan, I made my New York theatrical debut as a composer and lyricist. How did I get there? Ladner, British Columbia, where I grew up, was 3,000 miles away from Broadway. In 1921, it was 12 o'clock on the 1st of December, a newborn seven-pound son. When I arrived on a day they'll remember Cause it was cold outside And certainly nothing in my upbringing encouraged me toward the Big Apple. But it was a creative environment nonetheless. My father Ken was a commercial artist who worked for a major cinema chain 
and my mother Marion was a school teacher who saw to it that I was exposed to music at an early age, even though the efforts to get me to learn the piano would end in failure. Unbeknownst to my parents and teachers, I had already taught myself to read by the time I was four years old by watching television. It was all for the best that this child had no blessing. Still, everything sang to me. What was it that first attracted you to musical theater? Uh, that's an impossible one to answer because I think it's been in me since birth. When I was a child, my mother used to have the radio going and Mario Lanzo recordings or whatever they were, and I think they were just became part of my DNA. High school morning, clearing out my locker early, trying to straighten out a curly hair. My adoring, hit him with a scarabellum, putting on a splash of denim wear. It's too long a time for staying in one place, staying in the race, or giving him a chase. It's too good a day for keeping up the pace. I'd rather do it on my own Just walking the dog and riding my bike I'm tipping my hat to someone I like I'm batting a ball, I'm hitting a stride Just like a young man I'm driving a nail, I'm driving a car I'm getting the urge to enter a bar I'm trying to have a hat, I'm trying to see God Regard the young man In high school, I gravitated toward the school drama department My dear Fifi, you can't believe it was murder Blessed with a physique that resembled an arthritic coat rack and the breaking voice of a tone-deaf hyena, I was uniquely unsuited to principal roles in the school musicals. And so, at the age of 14, I created one of my own. It is the unanimous opinion of this council that because of your great successful effort to unite the world's three leading denominations forming the Canadian Church of Christ, featuring the Russian Holy and American Church of the Holy Saints, that you become worthy, Jacob Augustus Edward Chester, of receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. And got my sister to do the singing. One big, happy family, that's what it could be. One big, happy, beautiful world it could be. My teacher certainly didn't spot any talent to be nurtured. One even remarked, Who do you think you are, Richard Rogers? I was going to crack this problem. So I signed up for a class in music theory, in spite of the fact that I could not play any instrument proficiently. This was a highly disciplined environment. The other students were serious, accomplished musicians, and I aspired to their level of creativity. Alas, my hidden talents would remain hidden for a few years yet. But I discovered a fellow spirit, a classmate named Mark Telford. He and I stayed after school talking grandiose schemes. A musical. Of Macbeth. A group of friends of mine and I have formed a comedy group. A comedy group? Yeah, uh -huh. for satire. I see. And uh, we call it the National Film Bore of Canada. Uh huh. Okay. And uh, we uh, pick. Sounds like you got a good start already. Yeah. Um, we've produced one radio play called Macbeth. With soft shoe dancing witches and a porter in blackface. This was a show that would make Max Bielostock break out in goose pimples. And uh, we're going to try to work on staging it this Christmas. Wow. Did you have uh, pretty good success with it? Was it pretty well accepted when you put it on the air? Uh, I haven't gone on the, on the air yet. Oh, I see. You're, you're just going to do it. The station's lost the tape. They did? Oh, that's terrible. Uh, you only had one tape? I made the mistake of not sending a registered mail. Yes. And I know it was received, but I don't know who received it. Oh. I sent it to the program director, and I found out they don't have one. So we set to work, but then we hit an obstacle, and I suddenly wished 
that I had never persuaded the school board to scuttle the principal's plan to rename our school after the neighboring Indian tribe who used to rape and pillage our own Indians. Well, you, what are you doing? He banned all of our activities, and we were forced underground. Rehearsals began under the same tight discipline that I had learned in musicianship class. Somehow we pulled it off. On Vancouver Cooperative Radio, it's 7:30. We're going into now the Drama Festival tonight. A special pr production of Macbeth. Macbeth is the story of one man's quest for power and the manner in which he is encouraged by his steadfast and unrelenting wife. Macbeth greets three weird sisters, and following a brief love affair between one of the sisters and, and Banquet, Macbeth's partner, Macbeth is told that he will soon become king. He sends word home to Lady Macbeth to inform her of the good news. She probably, promptly writes back to him, asking what time he would be home for dinner and whether or not to put on the tea. I got the last laugh many years later when I discovered a book called Everything Baseball. In it, there is a list of song titles found in the Library of Congress. Among them was the baseball song, sung by the three witches to Macbeth and Banquo. Don't ask why there was a baseball scene in the opening of Macbeth, and don't ask how it found its way into a book published by Prentice Hall. Just accept it. Yay, King! Of course, Macbeth wasn't a real musical. I knew that, eventually. It was after high school when I joined the University of British Columbia's Musical Theatre Society that my real education began. Their alumni included some of Canada's greatest musical theatre talent, including Jeff Hislop and Brent Carver. Even Margot Kidder made her acting debut there. Lady, you get to your room and you stay there. Mr. McComber. You get out. Get out and stay out! It used to be that whenever I thought of Mussock, I thought of Grace McDonald. Grace, how long has Mussock been in existence? Well, I would say about 60 some odd years, but don't take that personally. I haven't been around that long. <laughs> how did you get involved with Mussock? Well, actually through Harry Price, because I was doing Theater of the Stars at the time. And when he started to do Mussock shows, he asked me if I'd come and choreograph. I think the first show we did was Student Prince. If I may ask, how long ago was that? Oh, Gad, this is my 30th show, but it's also my fourth retirement. Some of the shows I missed in between, but this is my 30th show with Mussock. The main thing about Mussock, uh, and I think a lot of it had to do with Grace's input, was that you really were having a lot of fun, but you were being very, very professional, because Grace wouldn't do it any other way. And it was a very, you know, when you were a young kid coming right straight from high school into something, that kind of sense of discipline and that sense of the profession, um, you don't know that's what you're getting until much afterwards. And you realize that you really were very fortunate that you had per a person like Grace there to give you some sense of what you had to do to come up with good work. To support myself, I worked freelance as an entertainment commentator with various local media outlets, print, radio, and television. I'd like to take some time to explain to you why I review the way I do. My job as a critic is to recommend shows that I think are good and warn you against shows that you might see at your own risk. But I think, uh, I think review writers are, are in short supply in this city. One of the reasons is there's nowhere for them to, you know, to show their material or there's nothing, I mean, it's very difficult to gamble on a big size musical, you know, uh, because musicals are so expensive. It's one thing to do a play like Talking Dirty with five actors. It's quite an, another thing to do a musical which requires, uh, you know, professional musicians and usually a cast in excess of 10 or 12. So I think this is a good opportunity for musical writers to get some exposure. And I know yourself, you've written material, and I think, you know, this is a venue where you can at least and at reasonably, you know, inexpensively expect some of your stuff to be tried out. You know, there's a number of writers and there's probably a lot more writers that I don't even know about who will be able to um, hopefully be able to showcase their work. 
Then an idea began to take shape. As a child, my father had told me bedtime stories about a tiger named Frady Cat who was afraid of his own shadow. problem was, I still couldn't write music. Or so I thought. That night, as I lay in bed, about to go to sleep, I mentally heard one of my tunes and could visualize the score in front of me. I wrote down what I saw. A few weeks later, we went into a recording studio, and within a couple of months, that same song was played nationally on CBC Radio. At CI Radio, some people can just struggle for years and years to uh, make their mark in the entertainment world, but some have it. And uh, there's a young fellow by the name of Mel Atke who has it. Atke has been writing a musical with uh, a character nicknamed Freddy Cat in the main role. And uh, I have a song I'd like to feature from that uh, musical right now. It's sung by Janice, or Janice actually. Jode. Mel, this is Ralph Lucas, CFQR Radio Montreal. I just wanted to say we have indeed added to our playlist Far Away. I just want to call like to say that we are doing your song, Tigress, here in Chicago at WTM. I'm going to try a new song here by a local girl, actually a girl who grew up in Kelowna, and now recording, making a professional debut. Hometown girl named Janice Joe here. The dam had broken. The theatrical potential of this highly visual piece was obvious. A number of directors became interested in staging Shikara, but then a new musical opened in London called Cats. Suddenly the idea of feline characters dancing on stage did not seem so original. But still, I had arrived, so I thought, and set out to conquer the big bad world of musical theatre. Atkey has been our resident film and theater reviewer for the past year. However, this will be his last show as he will be residing in Toronto. So he is going to give us some of his thoughts and feelings about leaving Vancouver. I've been with Metro Magazine and its predecessor, Tabloid 59, for just over a year now. And that has been a year of tremendous growth for me. I came to Cable 10 looking for an opportunity to gain experience in television. And I got that. I began doing on-location reports, then started reviewing movies and plays, and finally I recently did my very first live interview. However, everybody reaches a point in their careers when they realize that it is time to leave. I have reached that point. While Vancouver is a city with tremendous potential in the arts, I have found that I have to expand my boundaries and seek other experiences in order that I might grow as an artist. My destination is Toronto, where I hope to pursue my other career as a writer and composer of musicals. I would not consider myself prepared to do that if it weren't for the experience I have acquired as a part of Metro Magazine. It is the thirst for greater and more diversified experience that draws me away. I set out for Toronto, Canada's cultural capital and the world's 
third largest English-speaking theater center. Although I was a little fish in a big pond, I expected to rise quickly to the top. Of course, when a fish does that, it's not a good omen. For the first time, my passion for musicals and my fondness for science fiction coincided when James Doohan arrived. Name? Pharaoh. Vincent Alexander Pharaoh. Age? Oh, 55 to 75, although I'm usually cast at around 60. I meant your age? My age, huh? I'm... 62. Come on now, Mr. Farrow, don't you think you're a little, um, advanced to play the Prince of Denmark? Besides, we already have someone in mind for the part. Who is that? An actor with a vast reputation. Who is he? Edmund Keane. Very funny. It's not supposed to be. How on <laughs> They came down to a choice between Keane, Sir Ralph Richardson, and John Barrymore, but... Keen read rather well, so I tend to favor him. I don't know, what do you think? Well, I've never seen him act. Oh, it's a shame. He played Oedipus for us last season. Caused quite a sensation. I bet he would. You know, the, to me, the grand finale is, uh, is such a terrific play. It's about uh, uh, an actor who is about my age, um, and he's uh, auditioning for heaven. He doesn't know it at first, but he, uh, he finds out that uh, this is the problem, and he has... He has a lot of problem with uh, the director, who's uh, who's the guy in charge of either getting you in or getting you out. You know, it could be God Himself, it could be Saint Peter, it could be uh, I mean uh, Mother Anne. <laughs> you know, uh, who knows? Uh, the whole thing is uh, that it's a character that I would love to create, and I uh, really uh, I, I've been looking for a play, and this is it. James Dewan came to Toronto four times at his own expense for a series of intense workshops. Unfortunately, we never did find a producer to take the show on, and the theater where we planned to stage it closed its doors. I'm an actor, write me the words. Write me a song and I'll sing for you. That's all I'm asking you to do. Give me my cue. Well, I can say that I'm a typical Canadian musical theatre writer in the fact that my work has been performed in London and New York and never in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Although the theatre scene in Toronto was growing rapidly, there were no producers prepared to take on new musicals by new writers. And so, in 1991, I headed for London. It's ironic that a move to England would bring me closer to New York. It was while attending a performance in London that I met Bob Sickinger, an American writer and director who had been instrumental in establishing the off-loop theater scene in Chicago. Among his protégés had been Jim Jacobs and Warren Casey, the creators of Grease, and playwright David Mamet, who once told Esquire magazine, Bob Sickinger was one of the greatest directors I have ever known. Our first project together, a musical based on the Willa Cather novel, O Pioneers, opened at Producers Club 2 in Manhattan in April 2001. With the right kind of place, with the right kind of wife, he might have had a chance at the right kind of life. With a woman who was shy and free of any whim, who never gives a care for anyone but him. Yes. <laughs> 
lament uh, second chance I think that should go much slower than what we have there you know and uh, let's keep together as a team and I'm, I'm just really knocked out with you know with what you've done uh, I'm real happy and I hope that you'll be that happy with it too. It had been a 20-year journey but my work had finally arrived on a New York stage albeit one off off Broadway. After I returned to London, Bob asked if I would like to write another show with him. I had only written seven of the songs for O Pioneers, and we agreed that if we did another show together, I would write the entire score. He suggested a number of ideas, and we finally settled on Francis Hodgson Burnett's A Little Princess. Once again, we worked long distance, for two years. Bob would email scripts to me, and I would send music to him as MIDI files. Then he would record them with prospective cast members and send me the tapes. And witty and such a to do. The trinkets she's wearing are quite improper. He'll spoil her, I'm betting. She'll come up. Or as they call it, the princesses living in their royal. Waving down on all the downtrodden Who make quickly overwhelm They were born to take the helm But we who must make a living Through the mire of grit and grime Know a world that's bleak and dungy 
A Little Princess completed its three-week showcase at Wings Theatre in Greenwich Village in October 2003 and has since been performed in various community theatres. The New York Times wrote, A Little Princess has charm. Mel Atke, who wrote the score and lyrics, has composed lovely music whose fiddle passages recall period tunes. Having written what were essentially two American musicals, I began to think about developing my own distinctive voice. So that is the ancestral home of all the Atkins throughout the world. Exploring my family tree led me to the story of my ancestor James Atke, who left the Isle of Wight in the 1850s to become a missionary teacher to the Anishinaabeg people of Georgian Bay in Ontario. This would become my first book, When We Both Got to Heaven, published by Natural Heritage Books in 2002. It's funny because I wrote the book living in London, and uh, this is the first time I've actually been back to the place where it was set uh, since then. So it's kind of coming to life a bit. <laughs> Raised in Vancouver and Toronto, and now living in London, England, Mel Atke returned to Oxenden Cemetery to visit the grave of James Atke. James Atke was the first missionary to the area in the mid part of the 19th century. Mel Atke has chronicled that story in a new book titled When We Both Go to Heaven. Mel Atke's great, great, great grandfather, James, who's buried here, was witness to the original treaty negotiations with local First Nations people. Some of those issues are still in dispute today. As well as illuminating the place of the Atke family in the pioneering days in Ontario, Mal Atke's book is described as an important resource for insights into early treaty arrangements with local First Nations peoples. They were appalled at what the government was planning to do with them and forcing them off their land because their idea of educating them was that they would be fully active members of society and they found themselves in the position of leading the horse to water and not allowing it to drink. It would be a disservice to say the book focuses on land claims issues alone. It also speaks about pioneer history in general, genealogy, and explores early North American religious and missionary movements. On the Bruce Peninsula, Drew Ferguson, News Now. Next, I wanted to know how these cultural roots impacted the musical theater. Broadway North. Mel Atke has done a, a wonderful job, and I'm going to uh, <coughs> turn the microphone back to Kate so that she can introduce the gentleman who really has put an awful lot of himself in this book for a lot of years. And as you know, he is a composer, uh, and he knows the struggle, uh, but he's never given up, uh, and he certainly saw through to completion uh, the uh, book that we're celebrating tonight. So here is the author. But as a musical writer, uh, I know Lehman Engel, I unfortunately arrived here too late to be part of his workshops when he was running them, but he encouraged his students to study the work that went before them. But I felt that I wanted to study the work that went before us here, and for writing shows 
for the audience at hand rather than the one that's 500 miles away. So, um, and conversations with Norman Campbell about the early days of Canadian musical theatre is what inspired this book in the first place. The launch in Toronto included a cabaret with guest appearances by Canadian musical theatre stars including Pat Rose. I have run to the sun in the mountains of Ethiopia. Charlotte Moore. Whether it's flat, wherever they found out, perdition is at. There's only one fact that has to be faced. The whole and Dinah Christie. This was followed by similar events in Vancouver and Winnipeg. The book was well received by the Canadian musical theatre community, but what was really interesting was its international reception, especially in Australia, where many people saw the parallels to their own experience. Welcome to Broadway at Bedtime for the second time, Mel Atke. Okay, so Mel, the you are a theatre builder y yourself. Firstly, you write musicals, but you've also chosen to spend time documenting areas of the music theatre world that thus far really haven't been touched upon. Your first book, which you very kindly sent to me some time ago, Broadway North, um, is, a, is a celebration of the world that is only just a wee ways up from, from, from New York. And yeah, yet it's so far away. When you're a writer of musicals, you're encouraged to study the work that goes before you. But did everyone I... hear that? Anyone studying music theatre? Did you hear that? That you are <laughs> study the work that went before. Study the work that actually does go before yeah, you. Because, yeah, because because the world did exist. The world of musicals did exist before, before Wicked. And or mm. before Cats. Before Cats. Or before Rent. Exactly. Yes. Before mm. Oklahoma. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> um, what what? Why was it important to document your home country's theatre and let us know about it. And one of the things that tends to happen when you don't connect the dots on things like that, you never really move on because everybody has to reinvent the wheel each time. Mm. And, you know, people wish that there was a continuity to it. And I thought it would be interesting to do a book extending the same principles as Broadway North but looking at other countries and finding out what if any traditions there are there. The result has been a follow-up book, A Million Miles from Broadway, musical theatre beyond New York and London. Books on musicals, uh, which are generally all about Broadway, uh, claim it as the uniquely American art form, because, um, as I discovered growing up, that there were uh, uniquely Canadian musicals. And then after I wrote a bo book about that, I discovered that there were uniquely Australian musicals and uniquely South African musicals. So it is an international form, and it always has been. My research has so far taken me to Australia, Singapore, Germany, and the birthplace of musical comedy, Paris where I visited the world's oldest cabaret, the Lapin Gilles. This book will also cover musical theater in Japan, South Africa, and Argentina. Soon I found myself invited to address the Conference of the International Musical Theatre Educators Alliance in Hamburg and the Lyric Canada Conference at Brock University in Canada. How would all this research affect me as a musical writer? Would you like a bite? Grab a pizza after school. No, I'm turning right. I decided to write about the world in my own backyard. For years I had been incubating an idea for a very personal show that would draw on my own youth in Ladner. 
Initially, I wrote it for a cast of eight, and the setting was a high school reunion. One person dreamed of the things a winner dreams. One person never had a dream at all. One person tried to reach for the stars and found the higher you are, the harder you fall to the ground. Of course, the cost of land is high in Mississauga, but it is everywhere. Our house was a steal at 275000 One person dreamed of writing a symphony. One person dreamed of owning a home. One person dreamed of having a family. No person ever dreamed of being alone all his life. We send Don Jr. off to a private boarding school for ten months of the but year. what do I find with the passage of time when I reach the end of the rainbow? Then I reduced it to just two characters, a man and woman, who are meeting for the first time since they were teenagers and rediscovering their relationship. finalist in an international musical of the year competition in Aarhus, Denmark. Something in the air that I feel tonight, something in the world's turning out all right, and I know it will. Olivier award-winning actress Janie D used one of the songs, Something in the Air, as the opening number for her one-woman cabaret show. Running away with the circus began life as letters home to friends and colleagues during my three months with the American Universal Circus on tour in Taiwan, one of the most truly bizarre experiences of my life so far. I knew that I wanted to turn them into a book when my friend television producer Norman Campbell threatened jokingly to bootleg them and publish them under his own name. My nighttime day job is usually involved working backstage in various London West End theatres. However, in one occasion in 1997, I found myself facing a broken heart, unemployment, and worse yet, taking on a soul-destroying job to make ends meet. Then an ad appeared in the stage for circus workers. I jumped at it. A team of psychiatrists and the employee of my family then jumped on me, but I went anyway. Nothing could have prepared me for this experience. Not that any attempt was made to prepare me. I was fed a shocking litany of disinformation. Nobody would even tell me what sort of clothes to bring. I found myself in a foreign country with no understanding of the language or culture, doing a job that was deeply embroiled in local politics. The empresario, Mr. Xu Po Yun, who was presenting the circus, was deeply connected with the ruling Nationalist Party, who for the first time in history were losing their grip on power. As a result, we were being refused routine permits while facing down police corruption and being greeted by animal rights protesters, who we learned had more than a few valid points. Our trouble really began when, two weeks into our trip, we were forced to take down our tent because of an approaching typhoon. The cultural misunderstandings began to pile up, 
and when we asked for a six-ton forklift, we were given a four-ton and a two-ton instead. But the show went on, and I had a chance, in between guarding tigers and putting up tents, to explore some of the little-known tourist sites of Taiwan, including the Pescadores Islands, Sun Moon Lake, and the spectacular Alishan Forest Railway. We visited Taipei, Taichung, Tuliu, Kaohsiung, and Jiayi before it became clear that the reason why we were being paid late was not really because the cashier didn't get to the bank on time, and the promoter threatened to make one of our staff disappear if he didn't stop demanding his pay. We left in a very big hurry. At Goldsmiths University of London, I achieved my Master of Arts in Musical Theatre. This involved everything from musical theatre history to the actual creation of new works. Among my future musical projects is The Last Queen of Paradise, which tells the story of how Queen Liliuokalani lost her kingdom to a changing world.
If I could play a minuet for Mozart The sound would be a deeper shade of blue With a lightly embellished touch And a feel of the movement such That I could sing my song for you A place for me somewhere And passions run through me With petty little things forgotten Soothe me and nothing ever has the power to conceal How I know all my disaffected longings are real And how an understanding of the spirit can heal All that I know, all that I see
curse when I try to explore the universe and the truth of it all is who's out there now? What about the What about the mesmeric cycle? I can fly my kite to 